Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship here at First United Methodist Church in Fort Scott, Kansas. My name is Pastor Christopher Eshelman, and it's my joy to welcome you to worship as we come together to consider our discipleship, to consider our faith journey, to find ways to know and grow and share and serve in community with our neighbors. I invite you this day to stand and join in our opening hymn, From Christ From Whom All Blessings Flow. Please remain standing and join in our call to worship this morning. Creator God who made us to, to be loving, feeling, communal people. God is on the path to health and life everlasting. Serving God who watches us struggle to care for the bodies you created, both of our own and our neighbors. Save us Sustaining God who made us to need one another and mourns when we choose division instead of following in the way of Christ. Loving God who empowers us to love one another, diverse yet unified in God's love. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Galatians 3, 21 through 4, 7. It is the law then opposed to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if the law has been given that could make alive, then righteousness would indeed come through the law. But the scripture has imprisoned all things under the power of sin, so that what we promised through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. 
Therefore, the law was our dis dis discrepancy until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to this disciplinary. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you that were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are in one in Christ Jesus. And if you are belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. My point is this. Heirs, as long as they are minors, are no, longer, are no better than slaves, though they are the owners of all the property. But they remain under guardians and trustees until the date set by the Father. So with us, while we were more minors, we were enslaved into, to the instrumental spirits of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God.
second scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 31. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body through, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot were to say, because I am not heard, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear were to say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not be make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chooses. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I had no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indisp indispensable, as those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with great respect. Whereas more respectable members do not need this, but God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with, with, with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. All are apostles, all are prophets, all are teachers. Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do you all speak in tongues? Do you all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. May God add his bless may God bless the reading, hearing, and doing of his word.
You may be seated. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I've been drawing from a series on God's temple that was put together by the United Methodist Health Ministry Fund. And one of the things they emphasize is this series is not about shaming us about what we ought to do. I, for one, should drink less soda. Those kinds of things, we hear those messages. But so often they become these absolutes. And we fail to recognize how different things affect different people. I may have mentioned before, I have a dear friend who is on a high sodium diet. Do you know anybody on a high sodium diet? Normally it's low. We Americans consume way too much. She's wired differently. She had a family member that was low sodium for a long time. She would provide meals. She ate low sodium, but she wasn't getting enough. Her doctor told her to eat more salt. I could do that. But we focus on our bodies and we focus on what we ought to do. Robin and I got a letter from uh, Buck Run from the community center. And the first line was about our commitment to our health. And we obviously had that because we were members of the uh, exercise gym there at, at Buck Run Community Center. And I kind of looked at that and went, yeah, I signed up. Not sure I could tell you what it looks like inside. But at least for me, guilt doesn't help. That doesn't motivate me to go do the things that I know I ought to do. This series is about what God desires for us, not just individually, but in community. We are God's temple. There is something to the idea that our body is God's temple, but sometimes we get too literal about that and it becomes too individualistic, and we Americans are very good at making things too much about us and not enough about us. And the concept of this series is that we collectively are God's temple, that God dwells within each of us in community, that we can't be Christians by ourselves, that we can't be healthy by ourselves. We are built to live in community. Last week I asked, where does your food come from? Help us to think about our access to food, to healthy nutrition, to how nutrition changes, how our culture has made available to us nearly anything we could want any time. But often it's less nutritious than it was when we were truly eating seasonally and locally. It's both an opportunity and a challenge to track where our food comes from, how it's grown, who harvested it, how they're paid, where their food comes from, to think communally about how we eat. This Healthy Congregations program is designed to help us think communally about all sorts of different aspects of health. It challenges us to think not just about spiritual or physical health, but social health, emotional health to recognize that we are, whether we like it or not, connected necessarily, that none of us are truly self-made, that we all ultimately are dependent on the work, on the labor, on the commitment, on the participation of others, and that we are healthiest in community when we recognize that and seek actively to build one another up. This week I ran across an article from Sojourners Magazine. I had not seen it before. I am an on and off subscriber to that magazine. Sometimes I read it cover to cover and sometimes I go months without picking it up and then I'll let the subscription lapse because I'm not really using it. And then I'll run across an article like this one that completely justifies signing up again. It was about an artist named Makoto, Makoto Fujimura and his approach and use of materials. He has a theology around his art 
And he does things intentionally slowly. He uses a paint process in which pigments are pulverized minerals and precious metals that are intentionally applied in multiple layers, taking far, far longer than would be efficient. He argues that God doesn't really value efficiency, that God seems to delight in slow, methodical, incremental growth and change. And so his art reflects that. It's a style of art made for a type of long, unforced gaze that slowly reveals ever more depth, deceptively sim simple and quietly extravagant. He draws on what he calls a theology of making, which is a phrase that the Anglican theologian N.T. Wright first coined. A theology of making, and in Wright's writing, Christ inaugurates a new creation. In unexpected ways, this kingdom and kingdom of God that we are called into community in new ways, not based on rules and regulation, but on grace, on community, indeed on difference, that it takes time to build the beloved kingdom, that God is not in a hurry. And right, N.T. Wright also points out and Fujimara embraces an idea that God created beyond utility or need, that God is all sufficient. This is our doctrine of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, creator, redeemer, sustainer. God doesn't actually need us, which is maybe a disturbing thing to hear. God wants us. God intentionally makes space that we might be whole, and free to choose, that we might be free to say yes to God. God necessarily gives us the space to say no, to fall short. And yet God constantly invites humanity to co-labor with God in this new creation. It is shockingly inefficient. And yet it is what God seems to do, delighting in our slow, methodical growth in grace. Fujimara says God is love. Therefore, we followers of Christ must be about love. Yet too often the church is seen as sowers of hatred, divisiveness, and the power struggles of culture wars. We are projecting the opposite characteristics, he says, of the fruit of the spirit. And yet, when we look at creation, he says, we see extravagance of abundance everywhere in nature and the delights of God hidden everywhere for us to discover. God's purpose transcends way beyond our industrial, utilitarian, or pragmatic work. God loves beauty and mercy exactly because they stand as the antidote to survival at all cost mindset that is so normative for us in Western culture and indeed humanity after the fall. Fujimara is also a practitioner of an art of repair. And I've lost the correct term here. I will stumble across it, but it's a form of kinsugi, kinsugi, or golden repair in Japanese. In the Western mindset, very often to fix something means that you can never notice that it was broken. You want your car or the dish or whatever to not show anything from the accident. In Kinsugi, or golden repair, the Japanese embrace the scars, the brokenness. Pottery, for example, is often replaced with, is repaired with glues infused with precious metal so that the cracks actually stand out and make the dish even more beautiful for seeing what we would see as flaws. And they take their time with this. In some cases, the master teaching the student will pass shards down. The student will keep those shards unrepaired, studying them, pondering them, pondering the wholeness that has been disrupted 
And in many cases, they're passed on to their student before the repair is actually made. It is shockingly inefficient. And it is truly beautiful, creating a new whole that embraces the whole history of its brokenness. John Wesley probably never heard of that practice. And he certainly didn't have access to the Hubble telescope or the Webb telescope to see the galaxies beyond us. But he had this sense of wholeness, of new creation that includes the brokenness, a sense of grace as healing, a sense of grace as needing community, not just about ourselves. Many of us don't recognize one of his best-selling books. He wrote or compiled or republished a number of works. And we usually talk about his sermons and his guidelines for the societies that he founded, this renewal movement. But one of the most popular things that he wrote, indeed it was continued to be published decades after his death, was a book called Primitive Physic. It was basically a herbology manual. It was a book on health care. He wrote it in, 19, in 1747 and it was still being published in the 1860s. And taught about how to use natural remedies, how to brew teas and make soups out of the available components, the abundance of nature, to treat a whole range of conditions. Now some of what he wrote probably doesn't work. It's like grandma and great grandma's home cures. But increasingly, we see that many of those things did have value, do have value. Too often we replace the work of nature with the work of chemicals, which again is not to downplay the gifts that science brings us with some of the chemicals and pills and inoculations and vaccines. But sometimes we're fighting against ourselves when nature, when God has already provided means. And again, we seem to think that we'll all react the same way to the same thing, and it's just not true. Different compounds, different recipes, different treatments will be effective for different people. We are all wired a little bit differently. Our chemistry, even as we share genetic code, is a bit different for each of us, and we have to take time to find what works best individually and in community. And we get frustrating that it is so inefficient. And yet that is how God has created us. That is how God sustains us in community. We are called to join with God to be a holy and living sacrifice for all that we do to be done in communion. In Galatians, Paul writes perhaps one of his most famous lines, there is no longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, all are one in Christ. Paul is emphasizing to the Galatians our commonality. Paul knows as well as any of us that those distinctions do not get eliminated. Paul knows very well that there are still some who follow the law, that there are some who do not, who are called into this Christian community. Slavery is still a part of the Roman Empire. Two of his letters deal extensively with what should be the relationship between a master and a servant or a slave once both are Christian. Paul wrestles with this. The community wrestles with this. Paul certainly knows that there are still males and females and yet those distinctions do not separate us from the love of Christ. Those distinctions, those differences, are blended together in the whole of the community. There is no longer Jew nor Greek because God's grace is available to all. Paul uses in the Galatians the metaphor of childhood again. A couple weeks ago I preached about the realization I had that when Paul writes that his audience wasn't yet ready for solid food. They needed milk, spiritual milk, child's food. 
I had the realization that all of us, I don't care if we're one or 100, we're still children. We don't yet see. We may have grown, we may have a more mature palate yet, we may be able to deal with a wider range of spiritual truth, but we are still ultimately children. Here he uses that metaphor not as a challenge but as an assurance. Because we are still children, we are God's children. We are adopted. We are not just children but heirs. In Christ we are unified with God. And if you are then, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We are called into this community, this long-promised partnership where God works with our frail human limitations and promises to Abraham that his descendants will be more multiple than the sands and the stars. And God honors that promise, Paul says. We are children. We are heirs through Christ. Christ who was born of a woman. Christ who was born subject to the law. Christ who became like us, as the early church attested, that we might become like him. Christ who knows what it is to be human, to weep, to suffer, to be betrayed. Christ became like us, that we might become like him. We are freed from the law, not so that we can do anything we want to do, but we are freed from the shame and the guilt we're freed into grace in Christ. We are gathered together in all of our difference and diversity in Christ through whom all things were made. We together, he writes to the Corinthians, are the body of Christ. Each of us is a part of it. The ear is necessary, the eye is necessary, the hand is necessary, the foot is necessary. We can't ultimately divide ourselves we are all one in Christ, even as we have differences, distinctions, different gifts, a different role to play in the community. We are not all called to be apostles, not all called to be teachers, not all called to speak in tongues. We are given these different gifts that together, collectively, we can be the body of Christ, not for ourselves, but for the world. We again are called to be a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us. We are called to be communion for the world, to be community, to be the beloved kingdom, to embrace our difference and our diversity, to challenge one another, to build one another up, that we might each see more clearly, that we might invite others to the feast which God provides which God has prepared for us. I had some amazing conversations this week. Some of them were quite difficult. I had a couple of conversations with people with whom I deeply disagree. And we were candid about those different disagreements. And yet, I hope the other person in the conversation took from it the same thing I did which was to go deeper in our understanding, to seek to make sure that we are reflecting Christ in what we say and what we do. One of the conversations I had was in a clergy cohort I'm part of for transforming clergy. It's a group of clergy from uh, eight different states and I think it's at least four different denominations facing the current crisis in the American church trying to become better trained, better equipped agents of change and transformation. And those of us that embark on this kind of ministry, sometimes it becomes a little bit too much about us. And in the conversation, I was reminded of one of the things Bishop Sines often says to clergy when we gather, and he talks about the appointment process, and he talks about congregations and networks, and the church as a whole. See, Bishop Sines doesn't think he appoints us to churches. And I agree with him. Bishop Sines did not appoint me to First United Methodist Church. 
Bishop Sines appointed me to the Fort Scott mission field. It's too easy to withdraw in our walls and get busy with the meetings and the paperwork, important, necessary parts of ministry, but it ultimately can't be for us. It ultimately has to be for the community. It has to be for those who are not yet here, as the pastor that preached my class's ordination sermon challenged us, the not yet church. We live in a time in which Christianity is no longer the default in our society. In many ways that makes life harder for us, but I also think it allows us to be more fruitful. See, people don't come just out of habit, just out of rote, just out of social expectation. We get to go and look for what God is doing in our community and build it up and share what God has given us that we might walk the path together. That clergy cohort I'm in also reminded me that we are not the savior. Not the clergy, not the church. We are not the savior. The world already has a savior and it is not us. But we are called to participate in what God is doing, to join with the salvic work of Christ, with the movement of the Holy Spirit in the places where we gather and are planted, that all might experience the risen Christ, the resurrection, resurrected Christ, who Fujimara would point out still carries the wounds. He is making all things new, including you and I and this church and this community. And he does so bearing the wounds, bearing the worst that we have to offer and redeeming it and making it whole, making us and the world a new creation. I had another conversation this week that was both tremendously edifying and quite challenging. I have in the 15 months or so I've been here thrown out a whole lot of ideas. A few of them have been good ideas. A few of them we have adopted as a congregation. Sometimes the idea I threw out wasn't a particularly good idea, but it sparked somebody else to have a better idea. To tap into the energy that is happening here at First and in Fort Scott. To find ways to build bridges and connections and community not in spite of our differences, but because of them. I was challenged to explain to this person, and in turn explain to the congregation, how all of these crazy ideas I keep throwing out connect. Is there a comprehensive plan, I was asked. I've shared with you once before, my favorite ever SPRC evaluation came from a former appointment where somebody, they were just talking about how they were going to answer the questions on the form. And somebody just said out loud, you know, Christopher kind of goes off half cock, but it usually works out. And they all laughed and said, oh, we can't write that down. That's not, you know, holy enough. That's not. And I said, no, no, you are writing that down. That is me. I liked it. This conversation was the same kind of thing. How does this all fit together? I was challenged to think about how it is a comprehensive plan, how I think these things I'm throwing out there are part of one path towards renewal for this church and this community. I have on the screen one of those ideas, my favorite spiritual practice. I approached the Presbyterians that own the lot that used to be Whiteside's grocery store about setting up a labyrinth, doing something like this to kind of renew our partnership after this two years of COVID. We've cooperated on a number of things over the year. They provide the land and I'm providing the the structure and we are gradually building this path. And then a few weeks ago I asked some of our Wednesday work crew folks if they'd build benches and Ron jumped on that and built benches and then some other guys delivered them and figured out how to anchor them just to discourage anybody from walking off with them but making that space that much more inviting. A place to sit and ponder and pray. I had another conversation this week somebody who's working with stone, had some that weren't fit for his purpose, but might be perfect for the labyrinth. And so I went out and looked him over. Yeah, this is, this is a great blessing. And so gradually we're 
delivering that stone and adding to the debris that's there. One of the things I like about this site is it was a place of nourishment and community. And then it sat vacant for a long time. And now it's being renewed as a place of nourishment and community. And we're using the broken pieces and the rejected pieces to create a path that leads to wholeness. One of the reasons I propose this is I just like walking them and building them. It's edifying and healthy for me, and I like introducing the practice to others. But like I said, it's also about building connection with First Presbyterian and our partnership, and it's about creating space for the sacred in the Fort Scott community that doesn't require somebody to be brave enough to open the door of a church. Since we are no longer the culturally default, there are barriers even to those who are seeking spiritual nourishment. It's hard to decide to walk into church, especially if you weren't raised in a church environment. You're not sure what to expect or where to sit or what to do. The labyrinth on this shared space doesn't require anybody to commit to go Presbyterian or Methodist or even to know what their own questions are. It just invites them to walk to begin to ponder God's presence in their midst, in the midst of brokenness. It is an entryway for both of our congregations. I've also talked quite a bit about our building and how when I got here, I tried very intentionally to walk with new eyes. This building is a beautiful asset, a sign of God's abundance. It also in some ways represents a barrier. And we talked about how we can make the building more inviting. You know, those of us who have gone here for a long time, those of us who are used to church, we don't think about how intimidating it can be to enter the building. If you didn't know this building at all, and you walk in the front doors, where is the meeting room? It takes a commitment to get to the parlor. We think of nothing of holding a, an event in the parlor. You gotta go in and down a hall and you can't see where you're going from the door and you don't know where the exit is or the bathrooms are. When you walk in that main door you probably know the sanctuary is off to your left just because the building's fairly obvious but recently we put this, the clear glass on the front to make the front that much more inviting. You can see in before you make the commitment to open the door. We can see out and remind ourselves that it's not all about what happens in here. This building has been beautifully maintained, but it also sits empty a great deal of the time. And people drive by and they don't even see it anymore. We've been here since 1906. We're just part of the scenery. How do we make the building itself invitational? And about the time I was asking those kinds of questions, mural projects started popping up all over Fort Scott. They started in Gun Park with some quite beautiful spray paint art, but not the sort of thing I'd want to put on the building. And then they spread downtown, and there are four or five different artists that have contributed, but I was particularly drawn to a couple of them. The incredibly detailed Fort Scott postcard that is on Main Street Antiques Wall, and the sunflowers that are at Angie Dawn's. And so I did some asking around, and I looked at the art, and I figured out that they had the same artist in common, a woman named Danielle Tanner Myers. And so I reached out to her almost a year ago now and said, what if? See, we have this building, and it faces National Avenue. It's probably the second busiest, highest traffic point in Fort Scott. And it has these tan walls. What if we put a mural there? And at first, it wasn't a good idea. We hadn't gotten there yet. But I and Danielle and several of us that I talked to kept kind of wrestling with ideas and what we might do. And we now have a proposal. I have shared with trustees that Danielle believes that she can paint something like this using a brush technique that will make the flowers and the butterfly look a lot like stained glass. And she can fill that space that faces national and she can do that for a cost not to exceed $1,300.
And I have some people who have come forward and said, we'll cover the cost. But as I talked to trustees, they wanted to make this a community decision. And I'll admit, Tuesday night, I was a little irritated by that. We've been talking about this for a while. Let's just go. And the more I listened to the wisdom of that feedback, that's exactly what it needs to be. This, not, doesn't, this shouldn't just be a hair-breed idea that the pastor came up with. This should be a communal decision. This should be a joint statement of who we are as a congregation in the community of Fort Scott. And so over the next couple of weeks, you're going to have an opportunity to vote on whether we do a mural similar to this. Um, we won't vote this week, but we will set up a mechanism whereby you can cast your vote and say, should we do a mural? And is this how we want to present our theology and our church and make our church a little more inviting? And so we'll wrap that up by October 2nd at the fish fry, and then collectively we will have decided and if collectively we say no, we'll keep thinking about how do we use the building? And if collectively we say yes, we'll embark on getting this done and having it ready to invite people to come and come across that barrier of the sidewalk and come into the space and think about their own journey and their own transformation and stand in front of the butterfly and have wings for fun or Instagram or a senior picture and to get used to interacting with the community that is First United Methodist Church. And if this isn't the right idea, that's fine. We'll continue to brainstorm and think about how we do that, how we engage with community, how we know and grow and serve and share as the unique and distinctive people, as the diverse people known as the people of First United Methodist Church in Fort Scott, Kansas. We're working on some other projects that I hope you get a sense of part of the same constant question I'm asking. How do we build community? How do we grow this church? And the key is not to make that the goal. The moment we make that the goal, we are using people for our own needs. The way we grow a church is by seeking out and meeting the needs of others, fostering community and relationship so that it becomes easier and easier for somebody to go, I think I'm going to go check that church out. And so one of the projects we're launching in October is a Shepherd Center. Shepherd Center is a national network of community organizations, many of them at churches, some of them not, designed to meet spiritual and physical and social and emotional needs. It is intended for retired adults. It's open to anyone, but it's really aimed and intended for retired adults. And as I look around our church, that's what we've got. And those are the easiest relationships to build. That's also a need in this community. Loneliness and isolation, particularly for seniors, has grown. Becoming part of this network of shepherd centers enables us to help meet those needs and use one of our greatest assets, the building, that sits empty so much of the time. To use our classrooms to invite local experts and presenters in to share their knowledge, to help retired adults and others engage in lifelong learning and get more comfortable interacting with this community. Shepherd Centers counteract the negative effects of loneliness and isolation by connecting older adults to empowering programs that foster friendships. I did not realize until I was doing the research to propose this here as part of our Healthy Congregations grant that it started in Kansas City 50 years ago. So we are joining the network of Shepherd Centers on their 50th anniversary and they are excited because the last couple of years have been rough for them. A lot of their centers have closed. They've been in this sense of decline and what can we maintain and all of a sudden they had us calling saying, hey, we want to join this. And I've had multiple of their staffers call and say, we're excited about this. And here's another resource that you can use. We're not on our own. We can't be Christians on our own. And it can't be about us. It has to be about the conversation, sometimes difficult, sometimes challenging, always ultimately leading us deeper into our faith, into our discipleship, into our self-understanding as Christians, that we might celebrate and be connected, that we might be the body of Christ for the world. And you might notice our reading this week ended with Paul writing to the Corinthians, I will show you a still more excellent way. We will continue this 
line of thought next week as we continue our series on health and community and healthy congregations. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to join in our hymn of response. It's Help Us to Accept Each Other. It's number 560 in the Red Hymnal. number of announcements on the back of the bulletin. I invite you to turn and check those out. I want to highlight a few things that are not printed there. Uh, one, it is already time to be working on the October newsletter. And so if you have an article or an insight you would like included in that, if you would email that to me at pastor at firstumcfsks.org or to secretary at firstumcfsks.org. And I'll try to make that more legible next week. Um, I'd be happy to include your insight and uh, participation and mission in the newsletter and let people know what projects you are working on. Uh, tonight, today after the service, uh, the ASP group is selling mission sandwiches for a free will donation to continue to build up our uh, nest egg for future trips to Appalachian Service Project. The choir can always use more voices. You may notice we had six stalwart souls today sharing the gift of music with us. We would love to add your voice to that. They practice about 10 a.m. on Sunday and then briefly after the service. So you're not coming another night of the week. It's all contained on Sunday morning. So talk to Pat about that if you would be willing to help serve our congregation as one of the voices in the choir. We've got a couple of key meetings coming up this week. Uh, Finance and SPRC are meeting together at 7 o'clock in Fellowship Hall to do some necessary work to prepare for charge conference. And uh, then administrative board will be meeting Wednesday at 7 p.m. in the parlor. So if you have input for any of those committees, uh, you can call the church office to find out who all is on the committee and uh, drop them a note. And then uh, this is the coveted can count award from the Beacon Food Drive. Three and now four times the Presbyterians have challenged the United Methodists in Fort Scott to see who could raise the most food and support for the Beacon. And three times we have vanquished them. And last week they took a huge lead and I am tired of already of hearing from Seth about it. <laughs> he is reminding me that they are ahead on a regular basis. Last week they took in a grand total of 384 0.20 items and cash donations, and we had 215. 
I'm not sure we've ever been behind before, certainly not by this much. We need to step it up. So I invite you to continue to remember to bring things for the beacon. Uh, it does not end until October 10th, and so we've got plenty of time to catch up. I reminded Seth that the Chargers felt pretty good in the first quarter last week, too. So I'm confident in us, but we do need to step it up. Today, 6 o'clock, we have the ice cream social. UMW is coordinating that. They'll provide the ice cream. You provide the presents, invite friends and neighbors, and we will be taking a free will donation to help uh, UMW, UMW re rebuild its uh, cash reserves. Uh, October 2nd at 6 p.m., we're having a fish fry. We haven't done that in a few years, and so uh, Robert and Deborah and Bonnie and some other folks are working on that. And they came to me this week and said, let's not make this a potluck kind of thing. We've got people who are going to provide the stuff that goes with fish. A few of us can bring desserts if we'd like. But you're just invited to come and enjoy the meal and the fellowship and the community. I mentioned uh, that we're launching Shepherd Center October 14th, uh, 1130 uh, to 3 o'clock that day will be our first session. It will be completely free this time. There may be charges, particularly for the meal in the future, but this time we're funding the whole thing out of our grant. Uh, Marcia's Deli will be providing sack lunches for us with their uh, delicious sandwiches. And uh, this is a really great thing to invite friends or neighbors, particularly those you know who might need a place of connection. Uh, so October 14th, and then we'll have another one uh, March 10th, and we'll continue to build it up from there. I invite you to check out a yard sign. You may notice that last week and this week we've had these Reconnect to Faith yard signs all around the church. There are 13 or 14 of them. I would like about 10 of them to go to your house, particularly if you live on a fairly high traffic street, or maybe there's somebody in your neighborhood that you've been talking about coming. Plant this in your yard as another means of invitation and reminder and uh, at the bottom of the signs it's got our website and so they can check out the fish fry and shepherd center and all of the neat things that are happening here at first from the comfort of their own home so i invite you to check those out i've got a sign up lead sheet that doesn't really matter you can grab one in the yard put it in your yard keep it for two or three weeks when you're done with it assuming the kansas wind hasn't removed it for you feel free to bring it back and i'll store it and that is the Announcements I particularly wanted to highlight. There's some other upcoming events on the back of the bulletin. I encourage you to take that home each week and add things to your calendar. And let us move into a time of prayer. Gracious and holy God, we feel the spirit moving among us. We feel the energy and the delight of renewed events, of opportunities for fellowship, for community, both in this building and beyond it. We ask that you would help us to learn and grow, to serve and share, to be a holy and living and holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us, to be the body of Christ for this community that you have planted us in, to use our diverse gifts, our different understandings, even our disagreements as a way of inviting others to encounter you more fully, to walk their path to find their center, to find their place of communion with you and our neighbors. We pray these things in the power of your Holy Spirit and the name of Jesus the Christ who taught us these words. We continue in prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven. I invite the ushers to come forward and collect this day's part of our tithes and offerings.
Please join me in the prayer of dedication. God, our helper, every good gift comes from your open hand. You sent your son Jesus to become human, understanding our temptations and weaknesses. In our life of discipleship, help us to stand resolute in our commitment to follow Christ rather than the lures of our culture. Send your spirit to bring peace and contentment to our hearts. Let our congregation become a haven of those rich in good works and eager to share your message of hope. In gratitude, we dedicate our offerings through Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, number 557 in the United Methodist Hymnal. every idea I or anyone else has will be a good idea, but together we can discern what is the will of God, what is good and wholesome and pure, what will help draw the Fort Scott community closer to God, be the Methodist or Presbyterian or anyone else, that we might be the body of Christ in this place and in this time. Let us go forth and be just that. Peace be with you. Thank you.